Here's an article from The Lancet. It's a world recognized medical journal. And they're saying, Trends and incidents of diagnosed diabetes. A multi-country analysis of aggregate data from 22 million diagnoses in high-income and middle-income settings. The short version, and we'll talk about it as we go through this, it looked like the new diagnoses of diabetes were slowing down. So again, therefore, maybe a victory lap or maybe some applause for us as a race in terms of making a little bit of progress against what's clearly the most common disabler and killer in our species. But I think we would say maybe not quite so fast. There's some things that we need to think about in terms of this data. First of all is incidence versus prevalence. Incidence is new cases. Prevalence is the number of people with it. And in a disease like diabetes or prediabetes where people are living longer and longer and longer, with the disease, incidence often not the major driver of how many people in the world you have with diabetes. The second thing to consider is fasting blood glucose, FBG, versus hemoglobin A1C. As we've covered many times on the channel, A1C is not great for making the diagnosis. In fact, I clearly recommend doing a what's called an insulin survey. First of all, you have to challenge the pancreas. A snapshot when you're fasting is just not enough. And that's what a fasting blood glucose is. The other thing is just looking at glucose alone is not enough. About 10% of the people that I see that have a significant problem, you wouldn't have really known that they had much of a problem if you had looked at glucose alone. Once you challenge the pancreas with a glucose challenge and you measure insulin as well as glucose, you begin to see about 10% of these people are still holding their glucose numbers relatively good. But on the other hand, it's taking them twice, three times, five times, 10 times, and 12 times the optimal amount of insulin to keep that blood sugar in control. So again, very few people are doing even an OGTT, just the glucose challenge, let alone actually looking at insulin after a challenge like that. A1C a few years ago began to become the global standard rather than fasting blood glucose. A1C generically has several problems, especially in terms of making that first diagnosis. You see, it's glucose linked permanently to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's a protein. And that's one of the ways that diabetes, by the way, does its damage. Glucose in the blood actually links permanently to proteins. I had a teacher in med school who used to carry around a piece of plastic, a plastic model of muscle in his pocket. And he'd pull that out and he would say, this is what your muscle, your tissues look like on diabetes. And then people would, chuckle or look funny and he'd say, no, no, really, this is actually what happens. The, and he was talking about this fact that glucose bonds permanently to protein and can denature. Another example, a very common example of denatured protein is a fried egg. The protein is not denatured until you heat it and fry it. Once you've fried it, it's obviously not going to grow anymore or it's not a living thing anymore. That's what happens to our tissue on diabetes. Since it's looking at one specific protein and the glucose binding to that protein, hemoglobin, anything that happens to hemoglobin that causes hemoglobin variation will also cause variation in A1C. For example, pregnancy, which only happens to half our population. We also know that huge numbers of folks have variations in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin thalassemia, several other variations of hemoglobin have arisen in response to pressure from malaria in the tropical areas. Kidney disease, lung disease, and just plain old anemia. All of these things impact hemoglobin. So therefore, looking at hemoglobin is not a great way to diagnose new diabetes but that hasn't stopped us from doing it. The author did acknowledge that, you know what, one of the reasons that we're seeing decreased new cases of diabetes is during the time that they were following this, hemoglobin A1C became the standard. There were several places that did not get a, an increase. And I'll just mention one of them. The one place in the US was the Pacific Northwest it did not get that decrease that we saw in the rest of the US. Now, then they mentioned, they made a good point there. They said, well, there was only one specific group even within the Pacific Northwest. It was Kaiser Permanente patients. 
And that is a very telling item as well, because if you are a patient at Kaiser Permanente, you're much less likely to just get a diagnosis based on fasting glucose or A1C. You're much more likely to get true OGTT type of diagnosis. So for a whole bunch of reasons, this is not the good news that you might think. The last item I caution you to look to is go back to the title. This was only done in high income and middle income settings. Well, the majority of the world is not high income. And guess what? Diabetes is certainly increasing in that space. So we don't think it's quite time for a victory lap in terms of global diabetes. How about diabetes in the U.S.? This comes from a, another article. This is projection of diabetes burden through 2050. It's a CDC-based article. It was in the Diabetes Care. It was a study that aimed to project the number of people with diabetes in the U.S. through 2050. The method used combined age, gender, and race, a specific diagnosed diabetes rates predicted from 1980 to 1998. The information was obtained from the National Health Interview Study in, in Haines, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, which is part of the Bureau of Census. The results, there was an expected increase of 165% of people with the diagnosis of diabetes, going from 11 million in 2000 to 29 million in 2020, prevalence of 7.2% at that point, 437% increase in men, 271% increase in women. The conclusion was people with diabetes projected uh, 14 million in 2010, 19 or 20 million in 2025, and 23 million in 2020. Elderly greater than 75 years were the most, and minorities were the most affected. Well, here's a CDC comparison to that projection article that we just discussed. It was intended to update the 2017 National Diabetes Statistics Report. It was an analysis of trends in prevalence and incidence estimates over the time. Again, it also used in Haines, the National Institute of Health Interview Studies, several other national databases. The results, estimates for 2018, 34.2 million people of all ages had diabetes. That's 10% of the U.S. population, 2.8% of adults and 21.4% of adults with diabetes were not aware. In other words, one out of five full-blown diabetes patients had no clue. And that's about 3% of the total adult population. So again, you have to ask yourself, if you know you have diabetes, you may actually be the lucky one because one out of what? One out of 30? Can't juggle math and presenting at the same time, but I think it's about one out of 30 adults have diabetes and don't know it. And of the adults that have diabetes, one in four don't know it. So those numbers are very consistent with what I see in terms of my own practice. Prevalence trends, nine and a half percent from 99 to 2002 and 12% from 2013 to 2016. So highest prevalence groups, as we mentioned time and time again, among minorities, Indian, Alaska Natives, 15%, Hispanic, 12.5%, and non-Hispanic Black, 11.7%. And as we all know, higher among 45 to 64 year olds, median county level prevalence was 8% in 2004 and 13% in 2016. So that's looking at that map. If you look at that map and begin to realize that's diabetes spreading in our country. And guess what? None of this has been about prediabetes. And as we've mentioned multiple times, you get that tissue damage with prediabetes, including risk for heart attack and stroke. So I'd like to talk with you a minute about the webinar. People don't understand what the webinar is. It's actually a great way to get some access to healthcare that you're just not going to get any other way. You actually get the lab tests yourself for at a local lab, a Quest lab near you, for the inflammation panel and the OGTT and the insulin survey. These are things, inflammation and prediabetes, that your doctor just does not know about. And here's the thing, Harvard Health and many others have said, look, sudden death is not always so sudden. The Hollywood picture that it's a bolt out of the blue is not realistic. It's more like real lightning preceded by clouds, wind, and rain. Stop that metabolic storm before the lightning strikes. And here's where that metabolic storm comes from. It's inflammation 
and it has to do usually with prediabetes. So again, we actually get labs, we go over them in the webinar, and then you can start finding out how you can prevent that heart attack others said that you couldn't even predict. We can show you how. Thanks.